Lewis 102. This is going to be a mini lecture on satire. I wanted to let you wrestle with the ideas in a modest proposal as you had your first draft, but now that all those first drafts have been returned to you and you're looking at your comments and thinking about whether or not you want to revise, I want to give you just a little bit more information on satire as a genre. So, <clears throat> we're going to start at the very beginning. Satire in the beginning. So in Rome, we have two little stick figures. One is happy and one is sad, and their names are Horace and Juvenal. And Horace is happy because he's a happy satirist. And Juvenal is sad because he is a sad satirist. So <clears throat> when we talk about satire, we talk about two forms of satire. We talk about Horatian and Juvenalian. And these come from these two guys in Rome. And Horace, what he would do is he'd go out in the streets and he'd make lots of funny jokes and make fun of people in sort of a lighthearted way, but really still to address some of the problems he saw in the society. <clears throat> Juvenal, on the other hand, was very, very dark satirist. So I think a lot of times we think of satire as always being funny, but it's not necessarily about humor. <clears throat> it's also about just the ways that we use language to critique. So satire is really a critique of an institution, a part of society that the satirist doesn't approve of. And there are lots of different ways to accomplish that, but in the beginning there was sort of a more lighthearted form, just poking fun, and then there was this darker, more serious form that would really lead people to think about <coughs> all of these ills and problems in society. So if you think of Swift, and Swift is really the next really big wig in the world of satire because although there were a lot of satirists in between, they tend to work in either the, the Horatian or the Juvenalian mode. And then we have our next big wig, Swift. <clears throat> Swift is from England or Ireland. Um, we read him as part of the canon of English literature. And he kind of came up with his own kind of satire and we call it Swiftian satire. And it's sort of a combination of Juvenalian and Horatian. So if you've read Amada's proposal, you can see how there is some sort of lighthearted poking fun, but there are also some very serious undertones. And that proposal is very, very dark. So that's the Juvenalian part of Swift. But he started working in a mode that seemed to combine and really make more sophisticated all of the modes of satire that had been known before. So if satire is just making fun, how is it any different than, you know, just making fun of something? Well, because we work with a lot of literary um, tropes, with a lot of different kinds of concepts that sort of make satire satire. One of them that, that's probably the one we're most familiar with, but maybe is the most often misunderstood, is the concept of irony. And irony, there are three kinds, and that's dramatic, verbal, and situational irony. So dramatic irony is maybe the easiest to understand. If you've seen Romeo and Juliet and you think about the last scene, if you haven't seen it, plug your ears. If you know, you don't know what happens at the end of Romeo and Juliet. It's a tragedy. And so at the end of Romeo and Juliet, we have the, the lovers in the crypt. And now I can't remember all of a sudden which one of them is pretending to be dead. I think it's Juliet. And the other one comes in and sees the one, it's Romeo, the ones that are pretending to be dead and gets upset and thus kills herself. And we as the audience <clears throat> know that the dead member of the duo is not really dead, that they've taken a potion that is making them appear dead to the world, but is going to wake up, right? And so when we have Juliet come in and kill herself because her Romeo is dead, then we know that, oh crap, this is not the right thing to do and you want to yell at the stage at her, hey, don't do that, he's coming back. That's dramatic irony. So it's when the audience knows something that the players on screen don't know that makes their behavior kind of unbearable to watch. So that's sort of the easiest to understand. Um, verbal, so my favorite example, we have satirists and we have ironists, and they're sort of a form of satirist. Jonathan Swift is an ironist, especially in The Modest Proposal, but if you watch any of the contemporary political satire, so Saturday Night Live is a contemporary political satire, shows like The Simpsons and South Park are satire, um, but if you watch Comedy Central and you watch Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert, they're a really great way to distinguish between a satirist and an ironist. Uh, 
John Stewart is a satirist. He pokes fun at things, makes you laugh, but also think about the different the deeper issues that he's pointing out. Stephen Colbert is an ironist, and what a verbal ironist does is totally adopts the discourse or the way of speaking of the thing that they're making fun of and bring out ludicrousness or examples of what they want to critique through using the discourse of the person they're making fun of. Now, Jonathan Swift does this. So when he is talking about the British or he's talking about um, the landowners, he's sort of also kind of adopting what would be appealing to them when really he's making fun of what would be appealing to them. Think about when he talks about the babies and when he talks about wearing them as shoes and gloves, how grotesque that is, but he's also sort of making fun of the fact that when these people make these proposals, they are always looking for what's in it for them, right? So he's sort of adopting that as like, hey, look what's in it for you. Swift is also adopting the voice of an economist of his time, and so you might look for places where Swift is making fun of the way that economists talk or the way that they conceptualize problems. And so an ironist, what they're doing is they're adopting the voice of the object of their satire in order to make fun of it, and there's definitely some of that going on in Swift. Satire, of course, always has an object, so one of the most important things to figure out is, well, what is this making fun of? And it's usually not just one thing. In Modest Proposal, it's many things, right? The other type of irony is situational, and if you've heard the Atlantis Morissette song, not to, you know, age myself, about irony, a lot of what she's talking about is situational irony. A lot of the things she's talking about are not actually ironic, they're just unfortunate, but that's the idea of situational irony, <laughs> is when something happens that's sort of the exact opposite of what you intended to happen, that sort of thing. So in Swift irony, one of the ironies in Swift, maybe the central irony in Swift, is that he's talking about cannibalism, right? He's talking about this really grotesque thing that's happening, and maybe him proposing that grotesque thing is just pointing out things that are already grotesque that are happening in his society. So it would be ironic for, you know, all of the landowning ladies to be fainting away at this um, the suggestion he's making, when in fact the landowning class he believes is responsible for people's deaths, in, although they, they might not be cannibalizing them, in some ways they're equally responsible, and that's the central irony. So other types of literary concepts that we use in satire, one is parody. So a parody is just when you straight make fun of something. So parodies, a lot of things on Saturday Night Live are parodies. So when you see them, you know, making fun of a particular show, like um, Kathy Lee and Regis in the morning, and they're doing a morning show, that's called a parody, where you're sort of exaggerating the things that would already be funny about it to make it even funnier. And when you... Um, exaggerate them to the point of sort of creating emotional shock in your reader. We call that grotesque. And the grotesque is just, uh, we use it a lot in art, satirical art, right? So if somebody has a feature that you want to emphasize, making it just like super huge. But we also use it using words, right? So um, certainly there's a lot of grotesqueness happening in Swift's modest proposal, right? With the cannibalism. That's definitely grotesque. It's attention grabbing. And it's just making the darkest parts of what are happening in society super exaggerated. Exaggeration is one of the most important tools of satire, right? When we think of sarcasm, which is, you know, sort of one form of irony where you just say, nice hat, right? And you really mean that's a totally ugly hat. Um, that it's the most, it's not a very sophisticated form of satire, but it really relies on sort of exaggerating something about someone. And that's what the grotesque is about as well. So one of the most important concepts to understand is this one. And it's the difference between something that's literal and something that's figurative, right? And these are important concepts as we study literature in general. Something that's literal is literal cannibalism. Okay, means that Swift is saying, we are going to eat the babies, literally. That's my proposal. And, you know, I think we've all got, at this point, Swift is joking. Um, he's, it's a satire. He doesn't really want them to eat babies. 
but we might think of cannibalism also as figurative. So if we think about, you know, when something's literal, it's a figure of speech. And we, when something's literal, it's not a figure of speech. I'm all messed up right now. And so when we say, you know, I feel like I could literally eat a horse. Some people say that sometimes in, when we're talking, you know, just regularly to each other. I could literally eat a horse. Well, probably not, right? Because that would mean you were literally going to eat an entire horse. You were going to do it. So what you really mean is, I could figuratively eat a horse. And what that means is, I'm so hungry, I could eat a ton more than I would usually eat, right? So if we think of cannibalism in Swift as figurative, then what is it a figure for? What is cannibalism representing in the text? Because Swift might not be saying that we should actually eat babies, but he might be suggesting that there's already some form of figurative cannibalism happening in his society. And figurative cannibalism could be any time that humans are feeding or praying on one another. So you want to think about, you know, who is feeding or praying in a figurative sense on the poor people of Ireland. And he's making that grotesque, right? A term we just learned, um, by turning it into literal cannibalism and making it as gross as you can possibly imagine it, right? Because we're not just going to eat each other or each other's livestock. We're going to eat babies, okay? So the other thing about satire, um, some really dark juvenilian satire is missing this, but most satires because just making fun of something doesn't change anything, right? So when I'm asking you to think about Swift's purpose, and you're like, well, his purpose is to bring attention to that. Well, absolutely. And he's doing that by all of this exaggeration he's doing. But it's sort of the satirist's responsibility to have an exit strategy, right? Or a way out. We call it a way out. And that's what you're looking for in Swift's text as well, is, okay, so he, you know, doesn't think we should eat babies. He wants to get these people's attention who are, you know, keeping the Irish oppressed and in poverty. Well, what does he want them to actually do? Because is he a very good rhetorician? Is this a very good essay if he doesn't give any way out, any solution? Um, I don't know. So what you want to look for is what this is. And what you're probably going to find it is in an ironic voice. So is Swift making fun of something that seems all of a sudden like, hey, that sounds like a really viable solution to this problem. Is Swift maybe advocating for that? And it's just ironic. He's using an ironic voice to make fun of it, okay, when he really means for it to be the solution. In a lot of satires, the way out is presented like that, right, in the voice of the opposition, it would seem like a ridiculous or ludicrous way to get out of the situation. But for the satirist, they're really bringing that up to say, hey, look, this is the meat here of what I actually want you to do. And a lot of, um, and a lot of satires also, if you think about like dystopian satires, things like um, George Orwell's 1984, <clears throat> a dystopian satire often has some place that's, you know, somewhere outside the gates of the dystopia. So it's all dark, and sometimes we call that a green space. My light just went out. That was terrifying. Um, and so it's, you know, talking about dystopias, duh, and it, you know, attacks me. But so it's, it's something that's outside the walls of the society that's oppressing them, and that's the way out. But here in Swift, we're looking for it in a more rhetorical sense, so where he would provide actual solutions to the problem. Well, it looks like I have to get my light fixed, so I'm going to sign off. Hopefully this video has been helpful. Please see underneath for other announcements concerning this week.